Let me begin by uh, expressing that after that introduction, I was really looking forward to hearing myself. <laughs> I'm afraid sometimes the introduction is a little bit more substantial than the speech, and perhaps that could be the case tonight. My heartfelt thanks to all of you for coming and being a part of what has been a, a wonderful experience, and I thank all of you who have come to the podium and said nice things about me. Um, I enjoyed them. I wish my wife would have been here. <laughs> she needed to hear those things. Hopefully I will be able to go back and remember enough of them to tell her, you'll have no idea how they loved me over there. She'll say, then go back, and get some more of it. I do appreciate the members of the Knesset and other officials who are here because one of the things that I learned as a governor is that you're never looking for a place to go or something to do, ever. Every evening, there are dozens of places that you could attend and you have to make choices. Every day, there are dozens of people pulling upon you to be at a meeting, do something, and you have to make choices. I'm very respectful of the fact that tonight, every one of you have made a choice to be here. Perhaps uh, you were coerced by a friend. Perhaps it was the fact that the King David was gonna put on a wonderful dinner. But I wanna say thanks for your indulgence in being here. It means a lot to me personally, and I hope it means a lot for the longtime friendship that we will share to continue to get the message across to the world that Israel is a very special place. God's hand is upon it, and we must be mindful, respectful, and never be bashful about saying to the world that God's hand is upon Israel. No one in Israel should ever be afraid to boldly proclaim that the foundation of this country is not its politics, but it's his faith. Without its faith, it would not stand. With its faith, no one can ever stand against her. I want to say a special word of thanks to all of the people at the hotel staff. You know, these are the folks who work incredibly hard. They're on their feet for hours. They work their way among the tables to deliver food to us. They provided a wonderful meal. And I just think it's sometimes uh, uh, important that we stop and say thank you to those who have served us tonight. So join me in saying a word of thanks to this wonderful staff at the King David. I don't think there's anything that I could add to all of the talk that we've had tonight, talk I agree with, that Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel, that it should ever remain, that the idea of a two-state solution is a diplomatic fantasy, it is never going to happen, and we need to stop talking about it because all it's done is waste time and money of diplomats who have traveled all over the Middle East and beyond trying to pretend that they were doing something that they're not doing. And so once and for all, maybe we can put that aside. And one of the things I'm looking very much forward to in really just about two weeks and a day is to be able to say former President Obama and former Secretary of State John Kerry. People have asked me, do you think that Donald Trump will be more cordial, more helpful to Israel? I said, if Donald Trump was simply neutral and indifferent, you would be better off. But I think I can speak with some level of confidence and assurance that the incoming administration will prove to you very quickly that it takes its promises seriously, the promise to move the embassy, the promise to fight the very destructive BDS movement, which does as much harm to Arabs and Palestinians than it does to Jews, and that it will, in fact, create a totally different and new policy that recognizes the indigenous right of Israel to occupy, to own, to live in, to possess. They don't occupy uh, because they've, they've owned it. The only occupations have been by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Turks, the Brits. Um, 
but the owners of the land, Judea, Samaria, are the Israelis. And so I, I believe you're going to see a very fresh and exciting approach that the incoming American administration will take. And I'm looking forward to that. I want to tell you a simple story tonight, one that I hope will maybe explain why I, as an American, find it so important to stand with Israel. And I, I could perhaps share many different personal experiences, but I hope this speaks not to your head, but to your heart. A number of years ago, a young father brought his children to Israel for the first time. He wanted them to see this country. He wanted them to understand something of what it was about and what made it unique. And of his three children, he had two teenage sons and an 11-year-old daughter. He took his children to Yad Vashem, because what better way is there to understand the importance of modern-day Israel and the commitment of Israel to never, ever let something like the Holocaust happen again? <clears throat> this young father discussed with his wife whether or not the 11-year-old would be mature enough to understand and, and to absorb the extraordinary and sometimes very emotional experience of Yad Vashem. And many of you may remember that a number of years ago, Yad Vashem was even more intense than it is now. It was arranged very much in a chronological order, and the, the pictures and the artifacts were far more intense than they are now. And I know that many people said it's just too much. But in those days, it was strong. Personally, I think it needed to be strong. It needed to be intense. It needed to evoke an extraordinarily personal, deep, emotional reaction from everyone who went through it. But this young father, concerned that maybe the girl was too young to experience it, to process it, decided he would start the process of taking her through Yad Vashem. But if things became too emotional for her, then he would simply escort her out. So he took her through Yad Vashem, and as you remember in those days, it started out with the depiction of what happened as the Nazis came to power and how they first began to isolate, identify, and then truly harass Jewish people at every level, including making the children at a school wear a Star of David on their clothing, not as a point to identify them for honor, but to identify them at a point of derision and ridicule and hostility and bullying. And when the little girl saw what was happening to these children, it was hard for her to comprehend and understand how anybody could be so cruel to a child. As the father took his daughter to the next part of Yad Vashem, it depicted what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto as many Jewish families were taken from their homes, from their shops, they were herded together to live in small spaces. All of their valuables robbed from them. And then put in anything less than acceptable housing. And then the trains began to come to take them to the death camps that were operated by the Nazis. And oftentimes the parents would be taken away, but the children would be left behind. And in the cold of Warsaw in the winter, some of those children, many of them, died of exposure from the elements because they had no place to be. The Nazis were so proud of their horrors inflicted upon the Jewish people that we know some of the things that happened to those children, not because somebody told us, not because it was a legend, but because they actually photographed the most horrific things they did to kids, such as shooting them for sport in the streets. It's bad enough to do something that is that evil, but worse is to be so proud of it that you would actually photograph it because you somehow wanted people to know what you had done. Many children 
died in the streets. Hunger, deprivation. The little girl saw these pictures. She didn't say anything, just stare at them. Imagine an industry with no purpose other than to murder people. It's hard to even conceive that somebody can come up with a plan. It's even harder to conceive that people would follow it and would every day go to work and kill 10,000 people, go home, read stories to their family, put their kids to bed and have dinner with them, and then get up the next day and go kill 10,000 more people. That is the whole part of the Holocaust that I find most disturbing. But this father took his daughter through Yad Vashem and that depiction to understand how this happened because as it was happening, there were many people who never stood up, who never spoke up, who never stopped it. And once the Nazis realized that they were going to be able to get away with it because there was so little resistance, they continued to carry out their murderous acts until 6 million Jews and over 10 million people had been murdered. The father wondered whether the little girl got that message, whether she understood not only what had happened, but what it meant. Why was it important to speak up in the face of evil? Why is it important to speak up for righteousness? And are you willing to pay a price to do so? As the father took his little girl to the exit of Yad Vashem, you remember this is a guest book. You can sign your name and put your address down and then write comments. The little girl reached up into her father's pocket and she took the pen from his pocket and she began to write in the guest book. The father looked over the little girl's shoulder to see what she would write and she scrawled her name and address in her 11-year-old script. And she paused and then she began to write in the space for comments. And the father was particularly interested in what she would write in that space because what she wrote might indicate whether or not she got it. Whether or not this whole message that the father wanted his daughter to get took hold, sunk in, and made Hunter, her understand why he had brought her to this place and why she should never forget what happened and why she should give, if necessary, her last ounce of energy to make sure that on God's earth it never, ever, ever happened again. And he stood over his daughter's shoulder and he watched as she wrote these words. Words that he will never forget. She was only 11, but with an extraordinary perspective and wisdom, she wrote these simple words in that space. Why didn't somebody do something? Why didn't somebody do something? It was inconceivable to her that such a thing could happen to the silence of so many. And that was what she wrote. That's all she wrote, and with that she put the pen back in her father's pocket. And for the next several hours she didn't say a word. But that father never had to wonder whether she got it. And let me just say to you, I was that father. That little girl was my Sarah, who went through Yad Vashem for the first time at age 11. I have brought her back here, and one day I will bring what will soon be all six of my grandchildren to Israel and take them through Yad Vashem as a reminder that somebody always has to do something. I say to you tonight, my daughter is getting ready to take a job in the White House under Donald Trump and will be working in his administration as they take office. You may have seen her on television. She was often uh, a spokesperson for the campaign. And uh, Trump loves her. He likes me, but he loves my daughter. <laughs> and she's been an amazing political operative 
an incredible person of deep conviction. And you know what? Since that day, I've never had to wonder whether my daughter not only would have deep convictions, but would stand for them and with them unflinchingly. And I want every person to understand that the partnership that America and Israel has is deeper than political. It is deeper than financial. It comes to the very heart and soul, what it means to be a human being. And to understand that whether a person is a Jew or a Muslim or a Christian or a Hindu, that there must be a respect and an understanding that there is no such thing as a life without value. There is no such thing as a life that does not deserve the respect to be treated as a human being. And it's why that the value system that we hold, your country and mine, that values law and justice and that elevates and holds accountable all of us equally under the law and that believes that even when we are at war, we must do so in a way that is honorable and defensible. It's what separates us from savagery. And it's also what brings us together in a partnership that we need to preserve, protect, and pass on to our kids and to our grandkids. And I pledge to you that my commitment to you in Israel is one that is born from a deep sense of understanding that mutual bond of friendship and values. And I will continue to fight for that. Thank you and God bless. You brought tears in my eyes. Oh. And they're still